Welcome to Think Diverse, a fresh and deep look at the issues surrounding diversity and inclusion. I'm your host, Catherine DeVries, and I'm a Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at Pocono University. In every episode, I will pick the brain of one of my Pocono colleagues about their research about diversity and inclusion. This all to understand how diversity manifests itself in our daily lives, our society, and our economy. In this episode, we will talk about the effects of the Me Too movement. It's been five years since the Me Too movement went viral. Today, Dr. Silvia Cinque, lecturer in organization and HRM and deputy dean for diversity and inclusion at Sta Bocconi School of Management, will discuss how Me Too has transformed the workplace. Silvia, thank you for joining me here at Think Diverse. Thanks for having me, Catherine. So you're working on research on the Me Too movement and its impact on the workplace. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I'm studying the Me Too movement and uh, examining its impact uh, on people and organizations. So how it is changing and it has changed uh, in the last few years, uh, people and organizations. So we know that since 2017, the Me Too has been uh, urging society to confront the issue of of sexual harassment in the workplace, right? Which is a type of sex-based and uh, uh, gender-based harassment, which goes from verbal remarks to... um, physical and sexual assault, and that uh, in its manifestation usually exposes a relation of power. Uh, This type of sexual and sexist misconduct uh, is usually perpetrated by men towards women. Uh, Not always, of course. There are cases where the contrary occurs. Uh, We know that people with different gender identities may harass and be harassed. Uh, However, from a systemic perspective, it deals with a type of behavior um, which is ingrained in a particular uh, cultural system, a patriarchal system, where sexual dynamics and gender dynamics uh, uh, unfold within and through relations of power. And systemically, women who have been subjected to discrimination, marginalization, injustices in the workplace, but also outside the workplace, more than men, are more likely to experience sexual harassment. And actually, women uh, who embody more than one minority identity, such as they might have a disability or they might come from a uh, ethnic minority background, uh, they are even more likely to experience sexual harassment. So um, the project is uh, is about understanding how this type of misconduct uh, is um, it's managed and understood in the workplace, especially after uh, the need to uh, started in 2017. It is an international project, so I'm looking at three different countries, uh, Sweden, Denmark, and Italy. Um, although the project is still ongoing, I haven't finalized the data collection yet. For example, I haven't started in collecting data in Italy. Um, but the idea is to look at language policies and practices and um, in order to understand not just the extent of the change, uh, but also in order to understand uh, three uh, organizational dimensions, right? And these are management and resistance and uh, and sense making. And what do I mean by this? I mean, like, if you look at management, have organizations implemented their policies and their procedures in order to uh, deal with sexual harassment, to manage episodes of sexual harassment uh, in the workplace, but at the same time, how this implementation is being perceived. Uh, have organizations maybe become more bureaucratic or are these uh, process of implementing policies and practices uh, to handle sexual harassment at work, uh, bureaucratizing also uh, human relationships in the workplace. So we don't know, and I'm trying to make sense of this. Then the, the, there's the resistance side. Um, so who is resisting this change uh, if there is resistance? And uh, who is resisting, but also through which mechanisms this resistance is manifested. And finally, the sense making, uh, which means trying to understand how people, especially in different cultural contexts, uh, make sense of sexual harassment, uh, represent sexual harassment and narrate uh, sexual harassment. So this is the general idea of my uh, research study. <laughs> So just talking about the kind of last uh, factor that you really use, the kind of sense-making and different cultural contexts. So you said you focus on three different countries, so Sweden, Denmark, and Italy. Could you explain a little bit why you looked at these uh, three countries and what do you think it it yields? I'm Italian, so it kind of felt uh, a bit 
natural and also logical to uh, focus on my own country, so to study sexual harassment in my own country. Uh, Sweden and Denmark have a story behind, which is slightly different. And uh, uh, so when I, in 2020, when I was, uh, mm, you know, setting the ground for the, the study, I was invited as a visiting scholar at uh, Lund University in Sweden, and I was invited by Professor Mats Alveson, who's based at the Department of Economics and Management. So I spent the month of October 2020 there trying to refine the main idea of the project, also having conversations with colleagues uh, there. And uh, during that month, I funneled my interest towards academia. So trying to understand sexual harassment in academia and how the Me Too has changed uh, the management of sexual harassment in academia after 2017. Um, and I chose that because to focus on academia because uh, very interesting things were happening uh, at that time in Sweden and Denmark. So Sweden is a country that really felt the Me Too. So uh, there was much debate when the Me Too uh, started and uh, both inside academia, but also in, in, in their broader society, let's say. But um, they had also this uh, Me Too for, academi for academia, which is called uh, uh, Academiker Uproppet. So and I, I, I apologize for any uh, mispronunciation, which is the Me Too, the academic Me Too. So I interviewed people there while I was there. And in the meantime, in Denmark, the Me Too hit academia. Uh, 16, 16, I think, yes, uh, female um, academics based at different Danish uh, university uh, universities in Denmark, they wrote and signed a letter, which was basically a call for action to expose and address uh, sexism and sexual harassment uh, inside academia, where they stated in the letter, um, gender-based abusive behavior and sexual harassment uh, seems to be quite common. So I got in touch with this uh, group of uh, academic activists and uh, interviewed uh, the majority of them. So this is how I really uh, kicked off the project uh, in Sweden and Denmark, and then Italy, hopefully soon. Fascinating. So also a bit, you know, to kind of ask about your personal reasons, uh, perhaps next to academic reasons as to where you, uh, why you studied the topic. So, so what made you kind of get interested in this particular topic? Okay. This is an interesting question and a very personal question. And I, uh, and I tell you now, um, usually, uh, my inquiries, uh, originate from a conflict that I feel I have. Right. And in this case, uh, it's a conflict that I felt uh, in 2017, all of a sudden, during the outburst of the Me Too movement. So we know that year uh, Harvey Weinstein, the powerful American film producer, was arrested following uh, several accusations of uh, sexual harassment. And the actress Alisa Milano tweeted the hashtag Me Too, uh, encouraging all women across the globe to share their experiences of sexual abuse or harassment at work uh, publicly, right? So the hashtag went quickly viral, the Me Too became a social movement, uh, a powerful social movement, uh, which grow, uh, grew sorry, quite quickly uh, through social media. Um, anyhow, in, two, in 2017, I was, uh, when the Me Too started, I was doing the PhD in management at Nottingham University Business School. And I remember that I was studying at that moment the work of philosophy Philosophers Michel Foucault and Judith Butler, right, who have importantly informed the way gender, uh, sex, and sexuality are intertwined with uh, power in our uh, culture. And uh, also, I can say that in 2017, it was probably 20 years I was pursuing my anti-patriarchal battle, right? And then all of a sudden, when uh, you know all, uh, many women started raising their hands and saying, you know, me too, I have been also harassed at work. Uh, uh, I found myself questioning these women, so the victims, and I uh, was asking, were these claims genuine? And uh, regardless of whether the, the answer is, what's important is that I had a clear conflict, right? So from one side, I had this very anti-patriarchal spirit, and then from the other side, you know, a certain degree of skepticism. So it was kind of a challenge of me with myself. And uh, it was not an easy challenge. It was quite uncomfortable. Uh, I had to, you know, to engage in a deep process of self-reflection and self-understanding also of how certain question, why certain quest, I was asking certain questions. And uh, so it is important what that type of questioning 
triggered inside myself and that is and that's why uh, like that's how i started being interested in the topic uh i started having conversations with fellow academics with friends across the world and the uh, the responses that i was get, uh, i were getting were a bit mixed because many people around me as even people with you know quite progressive views um they were somehow skeptical of the ways organizations were becoming intransigent towards uh, certain types of behaviors in the workplace right so i decided to study the phenomenon uh, and uh, and you know reading and 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 researching how organizations have been changed by this so there is a very personal which is also rather political desire to understand the current status quo of sexual harassment in the workplace So we, before we go into the kind of way in which you think organizations have been affected, I was also triggered by your response now, if it might also be that just the definitions that people hold about sexual harassment and what is sexual harassment, maybe also what is sexual harassment in which circumstance and which cultures is very different. So I just wondered if you want to reflect a little bit on that before we... Well, we have to say something like, so we know right we human beings we uh know the world not just with rationality with our mind right we have also our senses and uh we s- might perceive when we are being sexually harassed um however it's a very slippery terrain because for example uh there might be certain gestures uh that m- for some people might not even been perceived has harassment like patting a shoulder or hugging so in italy for example we have a very physical uh, culture right i remember that when i was in the uk all of a sudden i gave two kisses to my phd supervisors and i i was oh my god what what, what am i doing here they were like they froze and i said sorry oh sorry what, what is this because the supervisor was also young one of them and so it's like what is the was i harassing them uh, or not so what does constitute sexual harassment is one question that people uh, raise and and sometimes it's very unclear of what it is sexual harassment and sometimes people also do not know that they are being harassed they might be subjected to sexual harassment but they don't know they are being harassed um so yes so this is like how sexual harassment might be perceived differently in different cultures first of all but also there might not be awareness of what constitutes sexual harassment exactly so how do you think organizations have been affected by the me too movement has it been this kind of idea that was initially in the movement of well this is a step towards freedom or equality at work uh, maybe you want to reflect a little bit on that Yes. Um well this is exactly what I'm trying to answer with my study, right? But uh, if so I haven't I haven't got the data yet. But if I have to answer your question with uh through existing uh, data, so existing research, uh, my sensation is that uh the answer is still unclear at the moment. For example, uh, some data coming from the US suggests that sexual harassment uh, still remains a very pervasive behavior in organizations. And this seems to be connected to a number of reasons uh, that have been uh, pointed out by Professor Heather Clark uh, in a recent uh, article that appeared in 2020 in the Journal of Business Ethics. So the first reason is that sexual harassment in organizations uh, is mainly uh, handled, managed through a legal approach more than a cultural one. So for example, uh, uh sexual harassment in in organizations involves the adoption of policies and procedures that will provide a defense in case uh, uh sexual harassment is um a claim of sexual harassment is made right but the majority of incidents remain uh underreported go underreported then the second reason so that's why it, it still remains pervasive and the second reason is that training to prevent sexual harassment uh, uh seems not to be very effective uh, and that's because apparently well according to Ether Clark in this study but also according to many other studies men do not understand uh in the same way as women uh, the experiences of sexual harassment right so men are victimized at a lower rate and they do not go through the world with the same vulnerability as women 
so they have, uh, as some scholars say, a different psychological experience of uh, social uh, social sexual behavior. So um, probably in order to reduce the sexual harassment, it's very important to also understand that uh, instead of having to do with a mismanaged sexual desire, it has to do more with um, a means of enforcing and regulating social status. Some research, for example, pointed out that um, um, at work, men sexualize female co-workers uh, not because they are sexually attracted to them, but most of the time in order to keep them in their place. Um, but however, some other data, uh, still coming from the US, suggest that yes, uh, after the Me Too, sexual harassment has decreased. However, this has been accompanied, uh, well, this has been going end in end uh, with a, an increase um, of hostility towards women. So the so-called backlash effect. And this is what, for example, um, uh, St uh, Stephanie uh, K. Johnson at uh, University of Colorado and her colleagues uh, discovered. They did a research in 2016. So first, uh, before the Me Too started in 2017, and then after, so in 2018. And interestingly, they find out that um, sexual coercion went down uh, from uh, uh, 25% in 2016 to uh, 16% in 2018, which is good. Uh, also, unwanted sexual behavior went down uh, from 66% in 2016 to 25% in 2018. Nonetheless, gender harassment increased from 76% to 92% in 2018. Uh, and what is gender harassment? It's a type of negative behavior towards women, um, which is not necessarily sexually based, but sexist based, right? So it's like just uh, harassing women because they are women. Um, my sensation is that um, generally speaking, the Me Too uh, is surely connected with the broader woke movement, right? So the woke also discourse which fights discriminations and injustices based on gender, sex, uh, uh, race and ethnicity, disability, age. Um, and the woke discourse has been changing organizations in the last few years. Uh, regardless of whether these organizations embrace this discourse uh, um, on an ethical ground, so it is right to uh, end discriminations because it is, you know, we have to do so because it's ethical, or whether they are being performative uh, uh, in doing so, in embracing the walk discourse, uh, and therefore just, you know, um, uh, they do so for to attract to attract their stakeholders and to have a positive image. But regardless of whether they are doing this uh, performatively or ethically, for sure organizations are are engaging with the work discourse and they are trying to, um, you know, end discriminations in the workplace. Uh, uh, so, but at the same time, it seems to me, not at the same time, it seems to me that all this, it's, um, uh, it puts society in a liminal phase, right? In a phase of passage between a very stereotypical, uh, you know, condition where sexual harassment was the norm in every industry at all levels. People knew it. It upset many, but very little was done. Um, to a situation where people are becoming more aware also through social media of the meaning of sexual harassment and how sexual harassment occurs. So, um, we are far, in my opinion, from a radical change in organizations, but at least uh, conversations today are, uh, you know, are engaged on the topic than before. Not just about sexual harassment, but any type of harassment or victimization or discrimination at work. So you already mentioned a couple of statistics in your response just now, but is there a particular kind of number or statistic that kind of stands out to illustrate the phenomenon? Well, it's very interesting to uh, to see that uh, uh, some uh, estimates suggest that nearly one in every two women is likely to experience sexual harassment during their employment. But uh, I suspect personally that that number is very likely to get higher 
if we, for example, include uh, uh, women also in volunteer work, vocational work, uh, vocational training, or even uh, if we take into account the context of access to employment. Uh, and if we speak about who experience sexual harassment, so just going beyond the, just the women uh, group, uh, then, of course, the numbers are very likely to get much higher than that. Um, so we are talking just about women right now, right? But, you know, as I said earlier, uh, people with many uh, different gender identities can be harassed, can be the subject of harassment. So that's very clear that it's a very widespread oh, uh, absolutely. A phenomenon. Exactly. Yes. So, so even though, you know, it is very widespread and Me Too, the Me Too hashtag and the entire movement and organization, um, that, uh, that, uh, that developed as a response to it, you know, was seen as a, as, as, as an important driver in starting the conversation for companies, but, you know, also in the public at large. Uh, the Me Too movement has also been criticized, and you already mentioned a little bit of a backlash. So, so could you maybe explain what what has been the major criticism? Yes, it seems to be you know a a, a grandiose phenomenon which came with uh, you know some criticism, and uh, the criticisms uh, against the Me Too movement are not uh, grounded in the message it conveys, right? So. Sexual harassment, it's a reality and we must end it now. But uh, towards certain ambiguities that it might bring with it. So, for example, uh, one of the criticisms is that the Me Too is more a matter of political correctness, you know, than a way to actually redesign uh, the social organizational issues of our time in a radical way. This is what, for example, philosopher Zlavoj Žižek uh, claimed has been claiming actually uh, in the last few years that people in organizations are obliged to behave and speak in a careful uh, and respectful in a careful and respectful way at work uh, avoiding to fall in uh, you know in uh, behavioral and linguistic uh, ambiguities but uh, is this a way some claim to radically change things so for example uh is a way even to sterilize the workplace by speaking, you know, just speaking politely and acting politely. So this is one criticism, which is very much connected to the fact that the social class dimension has been a bit marginalized in the Me Too movement. We need to remember that the Me Too started actually well before 2017. It started in 2006 in America when uh, the... Uh, African American activist Tarana Burke suggested Me Too, the phrase Me Too, in order to um, denounce the misery uh, of women's daily experiences, especially that of black women that were subjected to sexual violence, discrimination and exploitation. Then in 2017, the Me Too movement has been somehow uh, reappropriated by the uh, you know, the, the capitalistic, uh, liberal capitalistic bourgeois class, so the Hollywood class, uh, and the class, uh, uh, the social class dimension has been a bit uh, marginalized. And because of that, some claim it is just a matter of political correctness that rather than a way to redesign the, uh, the social organizational, social organizational issues of our time. Um, and then there's also another criticism. I think it's about the definition, as I said earlier, right? Uh, and the management of sexual harassment. What is sexual harassment? What does constitute uh, a certain behavior in different cultures? And, uh, for example, in order to avoid ambiguities, some, some organizations, especially large organizations are adopting the so-called zero tolerance, tolerance policies, right? Uh, where even Consensual, consensual intimate relationships can be considered sexual harassment when power is involved. So, for example, when two people, for example, a manager and a subordinate, are in the same chain of command, they are asked to report to HR for transparency in order to uh, avoid and prevent that uh, uh, the subordinate who's having a relation with uh, the manager gets promoted, gets, uh, you know, um, uh, um, uh, career advancement um, propositions and so on and so forth. And in this respect, I found actually uh, the morning, I don't know whether you've seen the morning show with uh, uh, Jennifer Aniston, uh, Steve Carell and Reese Witherspoon, which is ab exactly about the Me Too movement and how Difficult is to understand what 
exactly constitutes sexual harassment sometimes inside the workplace, especially when there is a consensual relationship between two people in the same chain of command. There is also the problem of uh, uh, reporting sexual harassment. This is another criticism that the Me Too has been very much uh, uh, supportive uh, of the speak up culture, right? That uh, uh, some organizations are embracing. Uh, so you have to speak up if you've been uh, a victim of sexual harassment, just come to us and speak up. But I don't think that uh, organizations, many organizations are still, have, uh, you know, are still ready to handle sexual harassment, uh, episodes of sexual harassment. If you think of the small, medium enterprises, do they have a, a, a system in place to handle uh, this type of uh, workplace harassment. Um, so they might not have such reporting system and, uh, um, and way to deal with it. So yes, speak up culture, but then what do we do about that really? And, and also who can really speak up? Because if you think of, uh, the employment uh, position of an individual, not everyone can really speak up. So another criticism is like, yes, the MeToo movement is encouraging women to speak up, but think about, for example, uh, or people who have been harassed in general, but think about, for example, of the gig workers, the temporary workers, the part-time workers who are generally women, how they can raise their hands and say, you know, me too. And uh, also there is the question of um, the politics and the aesthetics of the Me Too movement. Uh, there's a very interesting article that appeared recently in the journal Sexualities, written by uh, the sociologist uh, Rosalind Gill and Professor Shani Orgard, and uh, they indicated how the politics, the politics and aesthetics of the Me Too movement are actually exclusive because they insist on the binary division between men and women and therefore exclude from the debate uh, uh, different uh, different gender identities like a, a number of gender different gender identities such as transsexuals queers or uh, other non-conforming gender subjects and also the role of men you know some say you know it's just the responsibility of women to say no to refuse harassment and some others say well you know we had enough to be responsible for men in, in, you know, in my life, you know, I just want a break from that burden and responsibility. It's time that they do something and they actually can do something, uh, inside organizations because men can influence, you know, the organizational direction in either preventing or, or concealing, uh, sexual harassment as pointed out by, uh, Colin Ammerman, who's the director of the gender initiative at Harvard Business School. Uh, so the women, we don't need to be protected uh, from the misbehavior of men, but they need uh, leaders and managers who foster cultures where uh, sexual bullying, sexual harassment is uh, treated as a threat, uh, not just for women, but for the organization uh, at large. Uh, so these, I think, are the main criticisms that, um, you know, are targeting the MeToo movement at the moment, even in the last few years. So just in closing, uh, Bocconi's university's motto is knowledge that matters. So how do you think this research matters? Well, it matters because, and I, and I think, and I hope, uh, uh, you know, people and organizations will, will benefit, will benefit from it, especially academic organizations. Uh, it matters because it will show uh, how the, uh, not just how the Me Too movement has been changing organizations and people in organizations, but how people make sense of sexual harassment and how people resist sexual harassment. And this can be very useful for leadership and management in academic organizations to, you know, make sense of what's happening and to implement their policies, their procedures to make sense of what's happening in order to, to, to put even a system, reporting system in place in order to handle a misbehavior, which is very, very much ingrained in our, in our culture. So I tend to trust that the results will be insightful uh, in many ways, also help organization understand whether there are differences, cultural differences in the understanding and management, the understanding, the resisting and in the management of uh, sexual harassment at work. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Silvia, for your taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you all for listening. This was Think Diverse, a podcast on diversity and inclusion from Bocconi University. To be notified about new episodes, subscribe to Think Diverse on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Spreaker.